Okay, so welcome to our presentation on Jamovi and other point and click software for learning R. So the outline for today, we'll just go through some introductions and then I'll briefly talk about the Data and Decision Science Network. So that's why we're giving this talk. And then I'll quickly give a brief summary of common point and click interfaces for R. And then I'll hand over to Brad to give an introduction and demonstration of Jamovi. So just to introduce ourselves, um, so I'm Professor Marika Badaham. I'm the coordinator of the Data and Decision Science Initiative at UOW. I'm also the director of the National Institute for Applied Statistics Research Australia and the Stats Consulting Centre. And I'm really passionate about data literacy and I really like learning new packages and methods. And I'll just hand over to Brad to introduce himself. Yeah, uh, so I, I'm Brad Wakefield. I am a statistical consultant in the Stats Consulting Centre here at uh, UOW. Um, so I am a, a fairly new researcher to the, I've just kind of finished off my PhD. I just need to submit the final version. Um, and my interests are in data privacy, probability theory, statistical inference, and um, data analytics, data science, that kind of thing. Um, I have a real passion for ethical applications, data science methods um, in research and industry um, and presenting data in a way that's accessible to others. Um, and I enjoy learning, collaborating uh, with all other disciplines. I love having a chat about stats. Uh, if you get me into a discussion on stats, be prepared to lock me in for a few hours because I do tend to talk a little bit too much. Um, but if you, yeah, yeah any, any, any problems or questions, you're always welcome to send me an email and we can have a chat. All right, thanks. Great, thanks, Brad. And you'll be hearing more from Brad in a sec. So just to give you a bit of background about why we're running these network meetings. So um, the Data and Decision Science Initiative is part of the UOW strategic plan, and it developed from a review back in 2019 um, that established some recommendations for UOW about our capacity in the space of big data and health informatics in particular. And that was updated to reflect UOW post COVID and uh, the initiative commenced last year. So there are four key areas of focus. So the first one is research and that's encouraging a virtual network of um, researchers who are working in and interested in data science within UOW. And I've, uh, put an underline there under the component that we're having right now, which is themed meetings emphasizing translation. But we're also a focal point for coordinating the development of data science at UOW, and we're looking at strategic collaborations through the DDSI to give us a competitive advantage at UOW in translation in data science research. We're also really focused on education, and part of what we're doing today is educating you about different statistical software packages, but we also run a lot of training programs and we'll talk a little bit more about those at the end. We're particularly focusing on upskilling research students and staff in data and decision science methods. As part of the initi initiative, we're also looking at our undergraduate subjects and upskilling those subjects in terms of their capacity to teach our undergraduates data science skills so a lot of what we're doing there is switching over some of our undergraduate subjects from more point and click packages like SPSS towards Jamovi, for example, that we're talking about today is being used in several subjects now. And for some of the subjects, we're switching straight over to our studio. And we're also looking at external and industry engagement as well. So just to get started, um, on why we're covering this topic today. So R or Python, depending on what's, which discipline you're working in. Uh, we, Brad and I, particularly in statistics, focus more on R and R Studio. It's more focused for statistical methods, but quite a few disciplines on campus use Python, which is better for some types of data manipulation and machine learning, but also has statistical capacity. So they're both great. And anyone who's considering a career where they have to manipulate data or explore or analyze data where the, this is a major task, they should really consider learning a programming based language so to improve time management and encourage reproducible research. 
we're really advocating for R and Python because they're open source, but it could also be a commercial package. So there are some, um, some careers where they still use commercial packages such as SPSS or SAS, and they also have their own programming languages. So R is great, but, and this applies to Python as well, it has a steep learning curve. You have to remember many commands, the packages change regularly, and it's very hard to pick up if you don't use it often. So what if you don't use stats very often, you want something simple just to do basic visualization and descriptive analysis, and you've only got a few hours to gain a basic understanding of the data that you've collected or been given and you want something that's free, particularly if you're a student or something that you can use straight from the web, or you need a package to teach basic stats to your students. So this is a conversation that Brad and I often have, particularly with academic researchers who only need to use statistics a few times a year just to get a group on a data set that they're looking at or to help their student. Then learning R or Python is probably an investment of time that you don't have. So you need an option um, that's an easy option, uh, some sort of package that you can that you can get onto and get started started with straight away. So that's sort of what we want to talk about today: free point and click graphical user interfaces to R. So there are a number of these, and I've put here the most common ones with the website links for all of those. I've highlighted the top four, and I'm just going to discuss those briefly and talk about why we've made the decision here at UOW to encourage um, Jamovi in particular. So I'm just going to go through these four because they have different pros and cons. And um, some of you may want to engage with some of the ones that are a bit more advanced. And um, just going through these might show you which one would be particularly useful for you uh, in your own research or for teaching. So just to compare the four that I'm going to talk about very briefly, um, on the right there, I've really got the column that is giving you the critical information about why we picked Jamovi. Jamovi really is the best for getting started. If you need to sit down and in a couple of hours do an analysis, then Jamovi is the one for you. The limitations of this package is really in terms of graphics, and Brad will talk about that a little bit um, in his presentation. It does do some basic graphics, but if you really need to do visualization, I would say Jamovi is not a package for you. Um, the, the columns here also talk about the different areas that you would be looking for when you use a package. So the first column there is the primary one that a lot of you would be interested in, avoiding code. So JASP and Jamovi are very good for just click and go. Blue Sky and R Commander need a little bit more coding. If you're into data wrangling as well, if you need to do a lot of data manipulation, then you really need, um, as I said at the beginning, to invest in a more complicated package. In terms of the four we're offering, Blue Sky and R Commander are definitely better for data manipulation. But if you really have to do a lot of data manipulation or wrangling, you probably should go straight to R or Python. For graphics of these point and click ones, Blue Sky and R Commander tend to be a bit better. And for the number of statistical methods, again, if you need to do really complicated analyses, um, R Commander and Blue Sky are more likely to have these. But for your basic everyday, even up to mixed models, um, generalized linear models, um, and certainly even machine learning, um, JASP does machine learning. So it covers pretty much everything that you would need to know. But if it is something really specialized, again, you might have to go to something a bit more complicated. So just a really quick run through of the packages before we start on Jamovi. Um, R Commander is actually an R package and it's run through R, not R Studio. So some, sometimes people find this a little bit hard to even get started because you've got to run it through R um, and that's, you need to know how to install and load packages. So it is a bit more um, complicated to learn this one. The advantage of it is that because it is part of R, it does have all of the R packages available to it. So this is just a screenshot of what it looks like. And you can see that um, here it does actually produce, it's got a series of pull down menus up the top. Because this is a screenshot, I'm not doing this live, I can't click on them, but it's like SPSS or SAS in the, in the, or Starter in the way that you click on these and it comes up with options. So it's easy to run the models, but 
interesting thing here about the output of R Commander is that it actually gives you the R code. So if you're really wanting to learn R code, then this is um, one way of doing it. If you're planning on using R or you, you've had a bit of experience with R, R Commander is quite good because it'll let you um, use the point and click menus to do the models so you don't have to remember all of the code. So that would be an advantage to using R Commander. And what I'm doing with these packages is just running through a simple regression, looking at predicting um, cholesterol from weight in all of the packages, just to show you the different output that it gives you. So R Commander uses base R, and so its graphics um, are fairly uh, sort of base level graphics. They're not that flash, and the output is straight R output. If we move on to Blue Sky, um, this has an open source version. It's also got a commercial version. It was actually developed by people who used to work at SPSS, but it looks a bit less like SPSS than say Jamovi and JASP do. It's got a wide range of methods and it's, it's good for more advanced users. Um, it is based on tidyverse or modern R. And as you'll see in the next slide, it does have mathematical formulas in it. So it can be a little bit intimidating. So this is the user interface for um, Blue Sky. So you can see it's got the usual menu options up the top that you can click on. And I've done the same analysis here where we're looking at predicting cholesterol from weight and it actually outputs the formula as well as the actual R code. So it's still good for learning R code because it does print out the R code itself. And then it prints out the um, summary statistic, the coefficients and the ANOVA table. It prints it out in a sort of a nicer format than R Commander, where you can see here it's just printed it out in the R format. So here's your coefficient for um, the slope coefficient for weight and the intercept. And it does give you the formula. Blue Sky gives it in this format. So they're the harder two, the easier two. Uh, and here's the scatter plot, sorry for Blue Sky, of the um, weight versus cholesterol as well. It's based in DGPlot, which is a nicer package in R. So to look at us now, it is very similar to Jamovi, and that's because uh, the primary initial developer, Jonathan Love, um, is actually the person who moved from JAST to start Jamovi, so they look very, very similar. It's very point and click, um, but it was developed initially for Bayesian analysis. So it um, is on par with Jamovi for ease of use. It's slightly more overwhelming than Jamovi for an absolute beginner, which is why I put this one as the second choice. But you can see here, it's got um, this point and click options up the top of most of the common methods that you would want to do. And you just drag across the variables to run the analysis and the output's displayed immediately, which is what Brad will show you in Jamovi. So Jasper's quite similar to that. It dynamically updates. So unlike SPSS, where you've got to sort of wait for the output to come up, this will dynamically update as you are doing the analysis. And you can see here that it gives the, um, the intercept and the slope, the slope and the intercept the same way the other packages have. There's no actual R code on the screen, so it's not intimidating in that way for an absolute beginner. You're just getting the straight output and it's drag and drop. And there are a lot of extra options here. Um, Brad's going to do a regression, I think, so you'll see how to do that. And here's the scatter plot for Jazz. Movi, um, Two of the three founders are Australian, so uh, they're based at Newcastle, so that it's a local um, open source project. It looks like SPSS. It's got immediately visible output. It's absolutely great for introductory teaching because you can just get up and go. It's got a brilliant online free textbook and many online resources, including videos. We're already using it and teaching at UOW. The one caveat I'd say is that the graphics are a little bit limited. So just a screenshot of that. Again, it looks quite similar to JASP that we just saw. It's got the menu options up the top here. It's got drag and drop options here to do the regression. It produces dynamically the output with the intercept and the weight coefficient. And it produces a nice scatter plot as well here. So that's just a really brief overview. So that might give you an idea of some of the, some of the options the free point and click software. What we're really here to hear about today is learning Jamovi up from, from woe to go in about an hour and 10 minutes. So I'll hand over to Brad. And by the end of this, you should be able to use Jamovi. Yeah, thanks, Marika. Yes, um, 
I'm gonna, it's a, it's quite a crash course in Jamovi. So um, hold on and, and, you know, try to try to follow on. But of course this is being recorded and slides will be made available. So you can always, always come back to it. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a brief introduction of some of the common methods uh, and, and processes that we might wanna complete in Jamovi um, and how you would do it. And just the, the kind of broad setup of, of how Jamovi works. So, uh, if we have a look at what things I'm going to cover, I'm going to first just get us started in Jamovi um, and talk about, you know, how, how to how to download it. Um, and then we will dive into what happens when we, you know, get our data in, how are we going to set it up, ready for analysis, um, how are we going to define those variables, similar to how you would do a similar process in SPSS. Um, we'll then run through um, a quick explanation of how to, you know, get get some exploratory data analysis uh, completed on these variables, how to get some plots, some descriptive statistics, um, and, and really have a look at, at our variables um, in an exploratory sense. And then we will jump into a few different hypothesis testing um, approaches, some regression models, and I'll, I will touch it at the end, um, some how we can kind of integrate um, Jamovi with some R programming, how they kind of go hand in glove together. Um, and what other modules um, and statistical packages that might be handy uh, for you in your own research um, and to show that, you know, we can do quite, quite some complex things in Jamovi as well. So uh, to get started, I'll just say, and I, I think Marika's already kind of said this, but Jamovi is free, it's open source, and to download it, all you have to do is, you know, Google it essentially. Uh, luckily, it's a pretty distinct name. Um, and you'll be able to find it straight away and download it and get started. Um, and if you do want some installation steps or if you're in a kind of more atypical environment, um, you can always uh, have a look at the installation menu. There, there is um, quite some, some good instructions there. I will also say that Jamovi does have a web-based app as well. Uh, so basically you can, um, you can load Jamovi just on the internet without having to install any programs. Um, so if you're on the go and, you know, that might be handy, especially if you work a lot from a tablet. Um, so you can, you can, you know, use the Jamovi online thing. It makes it a little bit tricky when installing modules um, when you're using the online thing, but I think they're improving that uh, since I've last checked. So, um, you know, it, it's getting better and better as, as time goes on. All right. So let me just, I mean, I'm going to try and show you uh, live as we go, but I've got these slides here, one as a guide for me, but also um, in case there's something that I forget to talk about. Um, so when we open Jamovi, this is what it essentially looks like. We've got um, a, a, a spreadsheet view, very similar to what you would see in SPSS, um, but there's also this kind of uh, results view or this results window. And that's kind of like the output window in SPSS, if you're familiar with that. Um, which opens in a separate window. In Jamovi, it's, it's paired right next to uh, your, your data viewer, um, so you can see your output as you go. Um, and then we've got a few different tabs at the top. We've got our variables tab, which allows us to, you know, change details about um, our, what columns, essentially variables mean columns in this case, um, what variables we have in our data set. We can have a look at our data and we can edit it, we can change it, we can copy and paste um, all those nice things that, that we, you know, sometimes it's easier to do than when it's quite hard to do in, in R to do those kinds of small alterations or data entry. Um, and then we've got our analysis tab. And I've uh, just, this should be the default packages, um, but as we install more modules, they're called, um, we'll see more and more options appear up the top here. Uh, so if we click on the variables tab, you can open the variables view. Um, and if you click on the edit tab, um, we can see that this little results window pops up and this is completely editable. So I can change, you know, for DDSN Jamovi talk, I can give it a title. Um, I can, you know, insert code blocks if you, if you are so inclined, um, change different heading styles, change a line, bold font, italic font. That's really handy. Um, when you're going through, especially um, for teaching, especially, we can get students to comment on their outputs as they go um, right there, 
uh, in, in the one workbook. They don't have to be constantly switching between uh, Word documents. It's also really good if you, uh, you know, want to remember how you've done or why you've done certain analyses, you can comment um, as you go uh, throughout your, your, uh, your work flow without your research flow. Um, now we're going to, I'm going to show you an example of how to import some data. Um, and I will say as well, like, of course, you won't have access to this data, but um, if you do want to get up to Moby um, and kind of have a look at this as we go, um, you know, feel free to, to go. Again, it is going to go a bit quick, but um, anything that, that we skip over, you can always come back to. So uh, what we can do is we can delete these three default rows because we don't need them. Um, and it will just end up with nothing in our, in our data set. Um, and now we can import, uh, you know, some external data. It can take SPSS files, SAS uh, data. It can take uh, RDS files if you're an R user. It can take CSV, which is where a lot of data sets have been saved or downloaded as. Um, so to do that, you just click file, which is these three lines up the top, uh, click special import, and here I've got an example of a data set I can just load in and it very nicely loads in and I can see the data set. And it's quite clever. It can, it can work out what kind of variables we're dealing with um, just by loading it in, which is quite cool. Uh, so if, yep, we can select our data tab, we can see our data again. Um, to save our data, again, we just click up to the file option up here and then we can go save as. Um, and I can save it, you know, this is my wage data. And notice that it saves it as a .omv file. That's a Jamovi file. So if you just double click on those files, it'll open up nicely in a Jamovi window. So you don't have to import it. Once you've imported your data, you just have to, um, you can save it as a, a Jamovi file, um, which you can access later on. And it will just open up this window with all your nice results and comments saved. Uh, we can also, and I'll give, I'll show you an example of how we would add additional modules. And we're going to actually, if you want to play along at home, um, you might need to do this because we're going to use a, a data set from this module. So if you click on the modules option uh, and you click on Jamovi library, uh, you can see under the available tab, there's all sorts of packages uh, available to us to add on to our Jamovi program. So these are new modules or new little um, icons that can go up here, which contain uh, analyses, uh, packages to be able to do uh, all sorts of things. You can have a look through them. Um, I will go through a, a bit of this uh, later so we can, we can have a look at some of the more useful ones. Um, but the one we're looking for is the R data sets module. So let's see if I can find that. I remember it being somewhat close to the bottom. There it is. Oh, I've already got it installed. Um, if you don't already have it installed, that's all right. Just click install. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like when we, when we click install. Um, let's install this package, for instance. A little window just pops up and it automatically goes online, finds the package and downloads it and adds it to your, to your, um, to your program. Alrighty, um, now that we've done that, we should be able to, if we go to our file option and click open, we should have this little data library option appear. And because of that, I can click our data sets. And that, these are the data sets that we would have just installed by adding the our data sets module. And the uh, data set I'm gonna be looking at today and doing all the examples for is called MT cards. Um, it comes, it's basically, a data set uh, based on Motor Trend Car Magazine. Um, it details a few bits of information. It is all in US units, right? So we've got miles per gallon for, for fuel efficiency and um, there's other, there's cubic inches, I think in displacement and stuff. Um, but for the purposes of this, to just show how Jamovi works, um, I, think, I think it's all right. We can, we can overlook that uh, for the time being. All right. Oh. Let's go to the next one. So um, let's have a look at how I would define variables um, or kind of alter variables in Jamovi. So get it all set up because these here, you know, what does SYL stand for? What does DRAT stand for? These are quite common. We might want a bit more detail. 
Um, so if we click on a particular variable we're interested in, click on the variables tab. Um, so I've got a CYL selected here and then click edit. Um, I've got this little window that pops up that allows me to alter details around the data variable CYL or the column CYL. Now this column from memory has to do with the number of cylinders each car has. So I'm going to just write a little description down here, which helps me remember. Um, and the other thing it does is it gives you um, a list of what's called what they call levels in Jamovi and R, um, but are essentially just categories of a categorical variable. Um, and so here I could, for instance, apply a label like four cylinders, six cylinders, eight cylinders. And you can see, I haven't actually changed the values that are being saved um, in the data set. It's still four, it's still six, it's still eight, um, but all I've done is attribute a new label to them. Um, and this might be easier. If we go back to our data view, oh, I can, I can be pretty clear that, okay, the you know, Mazda RX4, whatever that is, uh, has six cylinders. All right. Um, and just a quick overview uh, of explaining what each of these things mean. And let's do it for AM this time. Um, quantitative variables, these are variables that have, or we can maybe better describe them as numeric, numeric variables. They have some kind of numeric meaning. Um, in Jamovi, um, all numeric variables are classed under the continuous uh, banner. Um, and so if it's a discrete, uh, discrete quantitative variable like this horsepower, um, I might go up here, I change it to continuous, but because it's discrete, which means, you know, in, in set increments, I'll keep it as a data type integer. Um, when it's something which is now on more of a scale, like this weight variable, um, I'm going to have continuous, but I'll also have a decimal type. And again, Jamovi is quite good at recognizing what uh, type of variables um, you know, these things are automatically. Sometimes you might need to do a little bit of adjustment though, like we had to do with this horsepower variable. Uh, for qualitative me uh, measures or qualitative variables, um, we have two kind of main categorizations, nominal, which are qualitative or categorical variables um, that have no order. And so example being something like male or female or brand of car or nationality. Um, we also have ordinal variables, which are qualitative variables that um, have some kind of order. So that would be something like age group or, or size of shirt, right? Small, medium, large, that's a categorical variable, but with some kind of order. So in this case with our cylinders, this is actually, you know, could probably be better described as an ordinal variable because I've got some order to this data. Um, whereas our uh, automatic, uh, our transmission type this is, and I'm just gonna type that in here. Uh, so automatic or manual, you know, there isn't really a, an order to that. So we're gonna keep that as being nominal. All right, um, and then also if I've got any variables that, you know, were actually just typed in like this one up here, um, we're gonna make sure that that data type is text. Um, sometimes things that should be uh, numeric are classed as text because you might have some kind of um, strange coding. Um, just make sure your, your data type suits the variable that you're dealing with. Um, and in this case, I'm going to treat this as an ID type variable because this is unique for each row. So it's an identifier variable. I don't really need a levels list detailing to me the different categories here because that's essentially what my data set is. All right, um, so uh, I, we've kind of already discussed this, but uh, let's have a look again for the transmission type. Um, the categories of this qualitative variable, categorical variable, um, we can express in the levels list. And for this case, especially, um, it's pretty unclear what zero represents and what one represents. Um, and I'm pretty sure zero represents automatic cars and one represents manual cars. And so I can, without changing the actual values um, in the underlying data set, 
I can attribute these labels to it. And it's quite easy. I don't have to open multiple windows to do this like you might want to do um, when you're doing it in SPSS. Uh, there's also this little option here that uh, allows us to um, retain unused levels. So sometimes we might have data sets um, that are missing particular levels and we want to still include that level, even though I don't have any actual realizations in my data set. So if you click that option there, um, then it will it will ensure that in all your outputs, it will show that, you know, yes, we have thought about this level, but we just don't have any in our data set. Uh, and to deal with missing data, this data set doesn't actually have any missing data, but if it did, um, I can click this option here and a little pop-up comes up and it allows me to tell Jamovi uh, what, what uh, coding that I have for missing data in my data set. Um, in this case, you know, common examples, NA, null, 999. Um, if you want to, for instance, say that uh, missing data has been written as null, within your data, um, I go source, double equals, double equals means the logical equals. This is R syntax that they apply in Jamovi. Um, double equals, and then I'm gonna put in here in, in quotation marks null. And that allow, means that I've, um, I've set a value for missing values. So if I did have a data set, a, a data point which has null in it, it will automatically know that this is a missing data um, point. All right. Uh, so uh, essentially we could have gone through and I'm not gonna do that now, but we could go through and make sure, I think I'm pretty much on the ball. I just have to fix up this one, uh, data, setup, change that to an ordinal. Um, the one next to it should be an ordinal too. Um, and you know this is this, but essentially this gives us a good understanding of what the underlying data is all about. So we've got fuel efficiency, number of cylinders, displacement, gross horsepower, uh, real axle ratio. I'm not an expert on cars, so please don't test me on what these terms actually mean. Um, I know things like fuel efficiency and weight, um, but and transmission type and number of forward gears and number of carburetors. But beyond that, I'm I'm getting a little bit iffy. It's beyond my scope of knowledge. Um, all right, uh, if we wanna compute new variables in Jamovi, uh, we, can, we can use uh, the compute option here. Um, I always like to have my computer variables next to the variables that use, I use to compute it. So suppose I want to compute a new variable that just tells me whether or not a particular car has fuel efficiency greater than 20 miles per gallon. So what I can do is I click this compute option. Um, I'm gonna call it, MPG 20. And here, all I have to do is write a code that allows Jamovi to compute it. Um, if I look down here, it gives me all the variables that I need. So I want to base it on MPG. So I want to say if MBG or MPG greater than 20. And what should be computed is a whole heap of true and falses. Now, what's cool about Jamovi is that this is a dynamic coding, a dynamic connection. So if I was to take this one and then make it 19, it will automatically know that it needs to change this computed variable. So um, your computed variables in Jamovi once set up will change as you make changes to the data set. So if you add new columns, you don't have to recompute it. It just automatically does it. Um, if you don't want it to automatically update, I always find it's good to just copy it and paste it and oh, as a new column, not over the top of an existing column. Um, and then you can have your static variable um, if that's what you're after. Um, but you know, I you know, if we were talking about trying to make sure um, that we are consistent in our analysis, having a dynamic coding is, is quite important. Um, the other thing we can do is we can do transformations of our variables. Um, so if I want to, for instance, um, compute the log of the weight rather than having the raw weight, I could click on the weight variable. I can click transform and um, selecting using transform, I can define a specific transformation for this variable. And what's really cool about this is that it saves and remembers that specific transformation. So if you wanna do it for multiple variables, you don't have to retype the code again, you can just apply it. 
Um, so for instance, if I want to take a log transform of the weight variable, I'm going to call my log transform ln for the natural log. And all I have to do is apply the code. Of course, here we've got our natural log. Um, so ln of the source, um, source being whatever you feed into it, um, that creates a, a log transformation of that particular variable. And if you see down here, now we've got a log transformed weight variable. And like I said, um, because sometimes these things, you, you actually do it for multiple variables, you don't have to recode it to, to apply that transformation again. All you have to do is just select it from your now transforms list. So I've also just computed the log transform of that one. You can also use uh, transform to recode variables. Um, so if I want to code, for instance, anything less than um, a particular value um, to be equal to you know, one or a string or whatever it is, you can apply these read code conditions using the transform. And again, um, you can do this, you can apply that same recoding to lots and lots of variables. You don't have to constantly keep writing the code, um, which can be quite infuriating. And again, this might be handy for anyone who's dealing with a lot of Likert scales, um, who's coded it in a certain way and they want to compute, say, numeric variables if they've coded it in a, in a, in a text or if they were to uh, compute um, a new coding. Um, these kinds of recode conditions can be really, really handy. All right, sorry, I'm going quite quick, but it is a crash course. So um, I'm hoping people are, are following along uh, quite nicely. Um, all right, uh, and again, just like with, um, just like with, sorry, just like with uh, the compute variable, the transform variable is dynamic. So if I was to change this one, um, let's change it to 10 so everyone can know very quickly, um, it updates this automatically. Okay, let's have a look at how we do some basic uh, exploratory data analysis in Jamovi. And it's quite simple. It's all in the one spot for Jamovi. You just go to the analyses tab, you go to the exploration option. And here we've got you know, only a few options, but only a few options is good because it makes our life easier. Um, and to do your basic exploratory analysis, we can just click this descriptives options here. And what will pop up is this little options for how we define our variables. And of course, we also get a new change to our results window. So here we can see um, how our results starts to look uh, when we, after our, we, you know, define our analyses. Uh, so uh, for instance, suppose I want to have a look at fuel efficiency, the miles per gallon, um, have a look at this variable, get some descriptives. All I have to do is arrow across to this variables list um, or, or, or even just drag and drop. If you're, if you're so inclined as well. Automatically, um, as soon as you do it, not you don't have to press a run button, you don't have to uh, press an okay button, it just straight away produces the statistics. And so this is really good um, because you get to see what changing the options, uh, what effect changing the options here um, has on your resulting output. Uh, to have a look at different statistic values, we just click on the statistic tabs and we can tell Jamovi which statistics we want calculated. Uh, so suppose I don't want minimum or maximum, but I definitely do want variance and range. Automatically, it will update my descriptives table. Um, I also might want a uh, standard error of the mean and the confidence interval for a mean. Again, straight away, without me needing to click any runs, I don't have to redo the analysis it just adds. So um, it's quite nice, quite dynamic, quite quick, um, which is which is always a good thing, especially if you're like me and uh, lazy and don't want to constantly be clicking menus um, all the time. You can also change how the table views. It doesn't have to go down column wise. You can have it go across rows. Um, you just have to switch it there. Um, sometimes it might be better, especially when you're dealing with lots of variables to have it in, in wide format for your table. But if you're only dealing with the one and if you've got a restricted desktop view like me, because I'm trying to run two windows at once, having it in columns is probably not a bad idea. Uh, you can also generate some really nice plots here. So if we want to generate some nice plots, I just click this plots tab, I can get my histogram um, and it produces uh, 
somewhat of a nice histogram. Um, again, the big problem with Jamovi is that you just don't get that customization um, ability. Uh, you can copy and paste this though into something like a Word document um, and make alterations there. Um, but that's not too great for reproducibility. If you want to regenerate it, of course, it, you'll have to go through that process again. Um, but it gives you what you need. So if this is, if you're just using this to get an indication, um, you know, these plots are quite nice. And of course, you can change, you know, the labels here and here by changing the names of your variables as well. Um, so if I want to add a density plot on top of this, all I have to do is click the density option and a nice smooth density option um, comes on top. Uh, if I want my box plots, of course, there'll only be the one box plot. Um, again, you know, the, the, the output is quite nice. It's just you don't have a lot of options to customize it. Um, and you can also add on top of that a violin plot, um, which are quite popular nowadays. And of course, you can, you can also see your data, which I always like. I like to see my data. And you can also add your mean to your box plot. So quite a few options there um, to, to improve it. Um, it's just you can't customize it in the way you might want to or you might be used to if you're coming from SPSS. All right, so um, to produce a scatter plot, because um, here we've just got our, our box plot, we've got a histogram. Scatter plots are also quite useful, um, especially when we're comparing the association between two uh, continuous or quantitative variables. Um, so I'm going to pick exploration and just click splatter, uh, scatter plot. Um, and in this case, I'm going to use weight as my x axis, and I'm going to use uh, MPG miles per gallon as my y axis. And very quickly, sorry, let me pull that over. Um, I can get a nice looking scatter plot out. Um, and if I want to put a linear regression line on top, because you know this looks like it's got a, a good relationship here, but it, to me, it might have a little bit of a bend to it. Um, so it might not be strictly linear. Um, so if I put my linear curve on there, can I see that bend? It might be easier to see. Oh yeah, there's a little bit of a bend because we've got kind of comes down and around there. Um, you can also use a smooth uh, regression line which they essentially produce um, via, a, I think it's a, either a GAM or a K nearest neighbors. I'm not exactly sure how they produce it, um, but it's a, a nice smooth plot. So that's always good when you're trying to compare um, nonlinear relationships um, in, your, in your scatter plot. And you can also um, tell it to add on the, on the margins um, some box plots as well. Um, which might be handy if you want to have a look for outliers uh, or marginal outliers um, or density plots. If you want to get a sense of the shape of the distribution marginally, um, you can also add that as well. All right. Um, and yeah, I just, I'll just show you if I, you want to copy and paste it, um, all you have to do is right click on the image um, you can do it for the full analysis, or you can do it just on, on a specific image. You can just copy it. And if I open Word, for instance, you can paste it straight in. It's probably going to take a while for my Word to open. Um, paste it straight in, and you get this nice little object, which, again, you can customize within your, within your Word document. All righty. Um, oh, and the other thing I should I should probably mention is what if you want to do exploratory data analysis or get some frequencies table out for categorical variables? Well, if you go up to your exploration descriptives again, um, if you put in a categorical variable, for instance, number of cylinders, it will still produce these statistics unless you tell it not to. But if you click this frequency table, um, it will produce this nice frequencies table um, which tells us, okay, all right, so I have 11 four cylinders, seven six cylinders, eight, eight, sorry, 14 eight cylinders in my data set. And again, if we want to just copy and paste any of these tables, we can do it into Word. And quite nicely, it saves it as a table object in Word, not as an image. So I can customize it um, within Word if I want without having to change too much.
All righty. Um, and if we want to have a look at uh, a continuous variable at, for different levels, so let's have a look at fuel efficiency across different numbers of cylinder, cylinders. I just arrow that across to my split by and I can get the breakdown for each, uh, each level or each category of cylinder, um, numbers of cylinders. And again, this one might probably look better um, in wide form. So I can see, oh, look, on average, um, fuel efficiency is higher for those with fewer cylinders. Okay, let's have a look at some hypothesis testing now. Um, so if we want to have, if we want to perform um, a one sample t-test in R, uh, in Jamobi, sorry, all I have to do is go up to my t-tests option. So ana analyses, t-tests, and it, you know, the options there, one sample t-test, and again, another uh, options window will pop up. Um, if you arrow, you know, we want to test whether the average fuel efficiency of cars tested exceeds 15 miles per gallon. So all I need to do is take my miles per gallon variable, put it across to my dependent variable. Straight away, I get some output getting spat out by Jamovi. Um, I need to tell it what test value to use. So I want to say, see if it exceeds 15 miles per gallon. So I'm going to put my test value as being 15. And because I'm trying to see if it exceeds it, I'm going to change my hypothesis to a one-sided hypothesis test, I could do it very simply by just clicking this option here and it changes my p-value to being a one-sided p-value. Um, what's also really cool about, about Jamovi is that it puts all your assumptions checking in the one spot for you and is pairing it with the one analysis so you don't have multiple um, analyses you have to do um, in order to just do a t-test. The assumption checks are right there. So if I want to check normality, um, I just click the my, my normality test and it gives me a Shapiro Wilk output. Um, I can also produce a QQ plot that can show whether or not um, you know, it's reasonable to assume a normal distribution uh, to this data. Um, we've got a bit of deviations here. Um, it does pass the Shapiro Wilk. So I'm going to leave that up to you guys what you think. <laughs> um, for this data, whether or not you think that's reasonable to assume. Um, there's also some nice descriptives plots. Um, it spits out some uh, confidence interval plots, um, which is which can be handy, especially um, when you want to get a sense of the variation in your data relative to the scale of it. Alrighty. Um, and I will also say that you don't have to go, if you want to, if for instance, we don't, you say you don't like this normality assumption, you think that Q, Q plot's way too wiggly, um, and I want to use a non-parametric test instead, all you have to do is click the Wilcox and ranked statistic and it will be produced as well. Um, so again, no, you don't have to do it in a separate analysis, it's all in the one spot, it's very, very straightforward. All right, let's have a look at testing the, dif uh, the difference in mean. So in this case, we want to look at uh, the difference in average fuel efficiency uh, between automatic and manual cars, for instance. Um, so in order to test this hypothesis, we can use an independent samples t-test. So all I do is I go back up to my t-test menu and this time select independent samples t-test. Um, Again, we're going to be dealing with the miles per gallon variable. So I'm going to arrow the miles per gallon variable across. Um, and I'll also need a grouping variable because we've got two groups. Um, and we're going to be basing it based on different transmission types. So I'm going to find my AM as my grouping variable. Um, and I'm going to arrow that across. And straight away, I've got some statistics being produced. All right, um, if we have a look at some of these options, uh, we've got our pooled t-test, so our students' uh, test is our pooled t-test or our equal variances assumed t-test. Um, if we wanna not assume or have unequal variances, when we have unequal variances, um, we'll use our unpooled t-test, that's the Welch's test. All I have to do is click that option and straight away the option comes up. Um, and it also does, Jamobi does let me know that perhaps I should be using the Welch's t-test here 
let's put a little asterisk next to this cystic and told me that Levens test is significant, um, uh, suggests a violation of the assumption of equal variance. So it, it does help you out. Um, we will get to, we can do our assumption checking, um, you know, we can actually do our Levens test um, by just selecting this option. Um, and it does also give me a little bit of help in interpreting this. It tells me that a low p-value suggests a violation of the assumptions of equal variances. So it's quite nice, um, especially when you might forget which way your, your tests are going. Um, we also have our non-parametric uh, test as well, our Mayor Whitney U test. Um, in this case, all right, we're significant on every one of them. Um, but you know, if we fail our normality checks, and let's have a look at our normality checks now, I can do that by just selecting under the assumption checks options, the normality test and the QQ plot. Here we see that uh, we we passed the Shapiro Wilk test, no problems, um, and our QQ plot's looking quite good here. Um, and so, uh, you know, we think it's reasonable uh, to assume a normal approximation and uh, go on from there. All right. Um, you can also get a few more statistics as you go if you want. Uh, if you want to get some uh, the mean difference and a confidence interval instead of a p-value, you can do that as well. Um, you can also get an indication of the effect size um, using either the Cohen's D uh, here, or if you're going down the um, non-parametric route, you've got the rank by serial correlation. Um, and you can also generate your nice confidence interval plot. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm just going to put this to the wider window so we can see. Um, so we can compare very nicely the difference in confidence intervals between automatic cars and manual cars. Again, we can't really customize this. Um, but with you know a few change of names of variables, we might get this looking pretty pretty good. All right, um, let's have a look at trying an ANOVA now. Um, so for an ANOVA, you just go analyses your ANOVA module. Um, in this case, we want to test whether or not fuel efficiency of the cars tested differed significantly between groups of cars with different numbers of cylinders. Um, so in this case, it would just be a one-way ANOVA. Um, so I can select, select the one-way ANOVA option. Um, here I arrow across, across my fuel efficiency variable again, um, and I need my grouping variable. This time it doesn't have to have two groups. It can have more than two groups. Um, and you know what I like about Jamovi too is it kind of gives you, it tells you like this has to be a continuous variable. This has to be a nominal and an ordinal variable. So it, it, it it helps you out. And if you try to make a mistake, it won't let you. All righty. Um, so if we have a look at our output, an ANOVA table gets produced straight away. Um, here it, we have two options. We can either assume equal variances in the groups, or we don't have to assume. Uh, sorry, we assume equal variances is the group for the fishes, or we don't assume equal variances. Um, it's telling if we remember back uh, to our tests, although we don't have to remember because we can just click the homogeneity test here. Um, we think it's we are seeing significant differences in variation in each of those groupings. Um, and so, you know, the Welch's tests or the Welch's statistic should probably be used instead. Um, we can also check normality again um, by clicking on normality tests and up pops the Shapiro Wilk test statistic and our um, QQ plot again. All right, and we can also do our post hoc testing very quickly um, by just clicking on this post hoc test tab. Um, and if I I can use my Chuki to when I assume equal variances um, or the games how if I'm not assuming equal variances. I quite like this because Jamovi, again, it, it gives you a little bit, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember what does the Chuki mean? What does this mean? Um, it gives it to you in brackets. So that, that really helps you out. Um, and it, it, you know, produces all of our tables for our, our post hoc tests. So in this case, we can see um, when we compare 
four cylinders to six cylinders, we see a significant difference. When we compare four cylinders to eight cylinders, we see a significant difference. And when we compare six cylinders to eight cylinders, we see a significant difference. Of course, we don't have to compare um, these, the, these ones because we've already done it, right? Four and six is actually reflected here. Um, and actually we can even tell it to flag which ones are significant, which are all three in this case. All righty. Um, now, if we want to test, suppose we want to test an association between two categorical variables. Um, in this case, case, we're going to check the association between numbers of gear or forward gears and transmission type. Um, we can do this with a chi-squared test of independence. Um, so in order to do a chi-squared test of independence or a chi-squared test of association, which is, I think, how they describe it here, you click the frequencies option. Um, you see under the contingency tables little uh, option here, we have our independent samples uh, chi-squared test of association. Um, and you can also have a look, you know, there are other tests we can do. So if you're, if you, if there's certain tests you want to do, um, you can have a look there. All right, so in this case, we're comparing number of forward keys and transmission type. So let's place gears, what does it tell me? Place gear on the rows, place AM or our transmission type as the columns. And straight away, we get our contingency table with counts out. Um, so we can see that we've got 15, uh, 15 cars, which are automatic that have three forward gears. We have four uh, automatic cars with four forward gears and we've got no automatic cars with five forward gears. For the manual, we have zero car, zero cars with three forward gears, eight uh, for four and five for five forward gears. All right, and straight away, it spits out our chi-squared test of independence. Um, to view, uh, to, to change how this table looks and to you know, get proportions out instead of counts, and to also have a look at our expected counts, um, we can go down, click the cells menu, click expected counts. And in this case, I also want my total percentages and it quickly updates. Um, now in this particular instance, we have, uh, you know, multiple cells with expected counts less than five. Um, if you look at this one, this has got an expected count less of five. This one's got an expected count less of five. This one's got an expected count less of five. And if you remember, when we do our chi-square test of independence, we want um, we we don't want that. We don't want uh, lots of cells with expected counts less than five. Um, so that suggests we should probably be using a Fisher's exact test instead of a chi-square test of independence. To do a Fisher's exact test statistic, though, we just go to our statistics tab. And straight away, I can click this option um, and the Fisher's exact test pops up um, and tells me that that's also significant. So there is certainly a significant association uh, between these two variables, which I don't think is any, that surprising to anyone. Um, but, you know, there we go. Um, of course, there's a, quite a few different uh, options here, tests you can do. Um, and you can also, uh, you know, produce some of these coefficients when we're dealing with strictly nominal or ordinal data. Um, and the other thing I did want to mention is that when you have two by two uh, contingency tables and you want to work out things like odds ratio uh, or relative risk, you can do that pretty easily. Um, I just don't have a variable here that I that makes a lot of sense to use relative risk on, um, but you do have that option um, if, if you're interested. Um, and the other thing we can do is we can also generate some nice bar plots. Um, so, you know, suppose I want to have a look at the differences between automatic and manual cars or in terms of count. Um, we can see, you know, there's definitely, there's definitely some kind of association going on here. Um, I can also change it from um, whether or not I want uh, my x-axis to be the columns or the rows. So I can reverse that around. So instead of having my colors as being uh, automatic manual, we now have our, our x-axis as being automatic manual. I can change from counts to percentages and I can change that as percentages of total or within columns or within things. 
And I can also use a stacked bar type, um, but I'm not insane because I, I'm not going to use a, back, a stacked bar type here because that's not going to really tell me much about my data um, side by side all the way. All righty. Uh, we can also do uh, some regression models in Jamovi. Um, regression models uh, and correlation, we can also determine correlations. Um, again, in order to do a regression model, all we need to do is go up to analyses, click the regression option, um, and you can see there's a variety of options that pops up. If you want to calculate a correlation, um, which I haven't actually done in my slides, but I can, I can show you how to do that. Um, I just click my regression, click my correlation matrix, um, and suppose I want to have a look at a correlation between miles, fuel efficiency, miles per gallon, and weight, and also with horsepower, we can see that all three of these things are significantly, um, have got a significant uh, correlation statistic. Um, we can see that, you know, there's a negative correlation between fuel efficiency and weight, which basically means um, the, the greater the weight, the less fuel efficient, or you, you can, of course, um, uh, reverse that to say um, the greater the fuel efficiency, the less the weight. Um, we've got a negative association with horsepower um, when we talk about uh, fuel efficiency. So the greater the fuel efficiency, the less the horsepower. Um, of course, the other is also true. Um, the greater the horsepower, the less the fuel efficiency. Um, and if we look at the association between weight and horsepower, we can see these things are positively associated. Um, and so, of course, the greater the weight corresponds to, but not as strong a correlation, um, the, the greater the horsepower. Um, and if we were dealing with, say, ordinal variables instead of continuous variables here, um, like in the instance of, of number of carburetors and number of gears, um, Pearson's co correlation statistic, probably not the best thing to be using here. So we can use our Spearman um, or Kendall's Tau B statistic to give us an indication of this association. Alrighty, um, we can also get confidence intervals and we can also get a, a correlation plot matrix as well, um, if, we, if we are so inclined. Alrighty. Um, Let's have a look at actually performing a linear regression now. So to perform a linear regression, if you click the regression option, you click linear regression. Um, I think Marika showed you uh, an example of this in her slides as well. Um, so suppose we wanted to model fuel efficiency with respect to horsepower, weight, and transmission type. Um, if I look at my variables list, I know that uh, miles per gallon is a, a continuous variable. So it makes sense for us to be using a linear regression and not a logistic regression. Um, and horsepower and weight are both continuous variables. So they're going to be going into my covariates listing. Um, again, Jamobi tells me where, where it goes. If it's a continuous thing, it should be going in the covariates. If it's a categorical thing, it should be going in the factors. So here I'm putting in uh, horsepower and weight into my covariates. And because transmission type is nominal, um, I'm going to be putting that into my factor variables. All right, um, straight away, we're getting some output as you would expect. Uh, we get our, our intercept uh, coefficient. We get our slope coefficient uh, for horsepower and weight. Of course, we expect these things to be negative because if you remember, they were negatively correlated with each other. Um, and we can have a look across and we can check our p-value and we can see that uh, horsepower and weight uh, are significant in our model. Um, we can have a look at, at the effect of our transmission type. And if you remember, if you're familiar with linear regression, um, there's always a baseline category when we're dealing with categorical predictors. Um, so, or a reference level, uh, we might want to call it. In this case, um, reference level will be manual. Um, so we're looking at the effect, oh, sorry, reference level is, let me, let me check, it's automatic, sorry. Um, and so we're looking at the effect of manual on top of automatic. And we can see that this isn't significant in our model. Um, if I wanted to reverse that 
if I wanted to, um, instead looking at the effect of automatic um, compared to manual cars, I just click this reference levels option and I can change it very quickly and it will automatically update uh, what is my reference level in my linear regression analysis. All right, and we've got a pretty good We've got a pretty good model going on right here. We've got a, an R squared value of 0 0.84. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll look into measure, model fit measures a bit more in a second. Um, if I wanted to build more complex interaction terms within my linear regression model, um, it's pretty straightforward. All I have to do is go to this model builder tab. And for instance, suppose I want to have an interaction term between horsepower and weight. All you have to do is select horsepower, select weight. So press the control button on your keyboard to select both of them. And if you arrow it across, a new interaction term will appear. Um, and you can do this with any combination. You can have a, a three-way inter... Uh, well, here we've got uh, the factorial interaction. So we've got a three-way interaction and all the sub interactions. If we want to get rid of a particular interaction term, I just arrow it back across. Um, and I'm sorry for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about interaction terms. Um, we do run, uh, uh, we, you know, there, there are, we will be running, I think, in the not too distant future, some, some, some seminars or, or workshops on, on building uh, regression models. But um, until this point, all we have to do is that it's a, in an indication of how these um, two va variables interplay with each other. Alrighty, um, so let's have a look at our assumptions because we always check our assumptions and statistics. And again, assumption checks has got its own little tab this time and it covers a whole heap of possible uh, assumption checks and diagnostics. Um, the common ones we will be checking is the normality in the residuals. So we can get our normality test out of our, for our residual data and our QQ plot in our residuals. Um, here we've got a little bit of worry down here, but it's not too bad, um, and it's not it's not uh, failing our Shapiro Wilk test. Um, we can also, if we're worried about autocorrelations within our data, so if you've got uh, perhaps time related data and you're a little bit worried that you haven't accounted for the autocorrelation that exists within that data, we can do an autocorrelation test, which you know we've got no issues with here, um, or collinearity as well. These are just measures of how uh, collinear these, these particular predictors in are, are in, our, in our model. And if we have a, we can also have a look at our residual plots. If we want to check our homogeneity of variances assumption, um, we don't want to see any systematic trends in our residuals. You know, this one's looking all right. And we've got a little bit of issues up in the top corner here, but it's looking all right. Here we see a little bit of funneling so that suggests perhaps something uh, might be might be not right with our variance assumption. There's a little bit here, but it's you know it's pretty spread out again altogether. Um, and the other thing we can do is we can determine our Cook's distance, which we use to check um, whether or not we have leveraged data or outlier influenced data. Um, and here our Cook's distance isn't too bad, so um, no real issues there. All right, um, we can also get all sorts of uh, tests, uh, all sorts of other tests out. Um, if I want to change whether or not I'm getting my R, R squared, I can get my adjusted R squared, I can get my root mean squared error. All it will do is pop up in this model fit measures up here um, with some more details. Um, or if I wanted to get an overall sense of whether or not this model is significant, in predicting or in accounting for the variation within our data, um, we can use our F test overall model test. Um, for our model coefficients, uh, if we want to get out an ANOVA table um, looking at each of our, our variables, sorry, widening this up, um, we can have a look um, more within the ANOVA kind of framework of our, of our regression model. Um, and of course, we can also get confidence intervals out as well, if you're more of a fan of confidence intervals instead of p-values. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about for regression 
is that you can also, if you wanted to do further analysis on your residuals, you can also get to maybe to save them. So say I wanted to save my predicted or fitted values out or my residuals, um, all my cooked distances, you can see it just adds a new column to my data. If I go back to my data view, you'll see them here. Um, it automatically generates them and I can use that for further analysis. And I'm thinking perhaps maybe for those interested in, um, if they do have autocorrelated data and they wanted to do some further analysis on that residuals, they certainly can. Right, again, um, like I, I meant that more to show you the, 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 what we can do if you're sitting there thinking, um, oh God, I don't know half the terms he just said, don't worry about it. Um, but as long as you know how to generate these coefficients, um, you know, that's, that's the main thing. If we can get our model coefficients table out and our model to fit measures, um, they're the main things to worry about. All the rest um, is if you wanna do any kind of further analyses down the track. Alrighty, um, let's open this back up and have a quick look, a very quick look at programming with R in Jamovi. Um, so as kind of Marika said, Jamovi is uh, a, a, a point and click um, uh, general user interface to R, which means at the heart of all of these analyses um, was R code. So all of these analyses and all of these tables and plots and graphics and things uh, were actually produced with R code. And if you want to see uh, the R code used to produce them, um, uh, you, all you have to do is click these three dots up the top here. Um, so in the top right corner, these three dots and then click syntax mode. And when you see syntax mode, you can see um, the actual R code used to generate um, generate these, these uh, outputs. And um, I'm going to try this, although my R has been playing up a little bit on me, but you can also um, connect Jamovi directly with R, with this JMV connect package. Um, I'm going to give it a go. I hope it works. Um, JMV is the Jamovi package in R, so you need to have that installed. If you're an R coder, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, JMV connect. And so we can actually ask uh, the JMV connect package to check what Jamovi um, documents are currently open. So here we can see we've got two Jamovi documents. I've got one, which is my little guide that you guys can't see um, open. Um, and there's also the MT cars data set, um, which we've been working on, which has been opened. So if I want to read that directly into R, all I have to do is tell it which one of these two Jamovi files I have open. I want to read into R. Um, let's read in the first one because that's all been nicely curated. Um, and now if I just have a look, I've actually just loaded directly from Jamovi straight into R. And what I can do is I can take this code now. You know, I've saved that code in my script file so I can reproduce it later, but I can actually run that directly into R and it produced the exact same table that we had in Jamovi. So you can kind of see the connection uh, between Jamovi and R and how these things are, are talking to each other and working. Um, you know, and this, this applies to any of these analyses we've, we've um, tried. Let's, if we want to do it for our one sample t-test, I can just copy it and I can paste it and straight away it will do all the things, including generate those nice plots um, in R, which later you can customize if you're familiar with R code. So, um, you know, perhaps you don't want to, you want to save your workflow from Jamovi um, and you want to save it in a reproducible form. I can just copy and paste it into an R script um, and I can run it all later and it will generate all the exact same outputs as I generated in Jamovi, which is, which is quite cool if you, if you ask me, but you know, I'm a stats nerd. So of course I'm going to find it cool. Um, and in fact, actually, I, I will say there are there are um, a few different options you can change here. Um, so if you want to change the color theme of your or the color palette of your uh, graphs, so change it to different colors, um, you can do it with in in uh, with the color palette options here. Um, of course, it limits um, the color palette to only uh, what options have been put in here. Um, 
it all you can also uh you can also change you know your p-value format whether or not you want it in decimal places or significant figures your number format whether or not you want it in significant figures or decimal places so it's quite easy to change the number of decimal places you're getting spat out um, if you want to look at something in more detail or if you need to be consistent with a particular journal's requirements um, you don't have to do anything by hand you can just get it to to generate it for you oh i probably should have zoomed out hey that would have made my anyway all right um So uh, the other thing, the, the, the other thing I wanted to show you um, for our programming is that if you can actually do direct programming in Jamovi, you can, you can actually write R code in Jamovi. Um, all you need to do is attach this RJ editor, mod, editor module, which happens to be the second one that appears here. So all you have to do is install it. And hopefully this does that pretty quickly. Um, and then we can get right, we can write R scripts within Jamovi. And that might be good if you've got to do a bit of data wrangling, a data, bit of data manipulation. Um, but what I often use it for um, is because, you know, I like to change my plots. I'm very particular about how my plots look. Um, you can actually do uh, plot coding, um, including the GG plot codes, if you're familiar with that, um, in Jamovi, uh, which, you know, uh, might might overcome some of the issues we have with with the graphics in your movie. This is taking quite a while. Let's see if I can do it again. This is the issue with doing things live. Sometimes they don't work. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, all you have to do to run our code in your movie is once you once you install this RJ editor module. Um, if you click the RJ editor option, which appears up here, this little window pops up. Um, this little window pops up and you can just write the code directly in there and then click this button, this button, and it, uh, it will generate whatever output that you would. It would be exactly the equivalent of typing that code into R. Um, and if I run this here, you can see what that would actually look like. Produce that nice little plot there. So you can actually do more complicated plotting. You just need to work. At, uh, you just need to do a bit of R programming in the meantime, and hopefully this installs at some point later down the track. All right. Uh, very last thing I wanted to talk about because um, I know I, I've given you quite a lot of information, and I don't want to. I don't want to overload you. Um, is the other useful modules that we can use in Jamovi, although right now I'm having trouble installing any modules. Um, so uh, uh, one which is probably quite useful for any of those, any people doing any kind of longitudinal panel data analyses or need to account for uh, correlation structures or hierarchical data within their models, this GAMLJ uh, module uh, allows you to do all that kind of uh, mixed modeling and um, general additive models as well if you wanted to go down uh, that pathway. The Walrus package is one that I use quite often, um, which is basically robust statistical methods. So that allows you to perform tests when perhaps your assumptions aren't necessarily the best. Um, it allows you to pr perform them. Uh, so if you, know, you don't quite meet your assumptions, you need to perform say um, a, a factorial ANOVA, you can do that with the Walrus package. Um, and again, this is all kind of based on, you know, thoroughly uh, peer reviewed work uh, already out there. If you want to do some survival analysis, you can do it quite easily in Jamovi with either the death watch, uh, which is kind of a, a you know, morbid name to name it, and J survival uh, packages. So either one of those, you can do some survival analysis. So your Kaplan Meier curves and um, Cox proportional hazard models. Uh, if you want to do some basic power calculations, um, so power calculations for t-tests and things, you can do it with the J-Power uh, module. Um, structural equation modeling, which I have to admit it's not my area of expertise, um, but you can do it in Jamovi. Um, and this is, it's basically a, a, an application of the Levan uh, in, in Jamovi. 
Uh, JSQ does some Bayesian model. If you're more of a fan of Bayesian hypothesis testing, um, you can use JSQ to do that. Meta-analysis, you can use the major package. Um, and if you're a fan of, if you want to do some you know, unsupervised machine learning, some clustering, um, you can use the Snow Cluster uh, software. But there's there's so many packages up here, you know, I suggest having a look through, seeing if there's anything that applies to you. These are just the ones that I thought might be of use uh, to you guys. Um, but again, you know, we've got path analysis there. There's 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 a few graphing softwares, but they're never they're not that great either. Um, but you're welcome to give them a go if you if you're interested. But yeah, there's quite a lot of packages um, freely available um, there for you to load in. And there's more packages getting added all the time. You know, I think I'm up to date, and then more packages get added. So this will only expand just like it does in R. You know, it started off with now now R has seventy thousand packages. I'm sure it might not get to that stage. Um, but, you know, it, it, it will get bigger and bigger as time go on. All right. Um, I think that's all 